every STI is either curable, treatable, manageable. What's your carnal theory? And today on Carnal Theory, we are joined by Emily DePass, a sex and relationship expert who's on a mission to provide accurate and inclusive information on some of society's most misunderstood and shame-fueled topics. In 2019, Emily founded Sex Education, which is providing resources for those working through a positive STI diagnosis, trying to find their authentic voices in their relationships, and also for educators who are seeking a more comprehensive approach to confronting these stigmas in the classroom. Emily, thank you so much for being here today. We are really excited to have you. I'm really excited to start this conversation with both of you. How do you see people starting to mentally break this stigma down and and like reflect upon it and deal with it? So I believe that people aren't really confronted with even breaking down stigma until they really know someone who says, hey, I have herpes or I have cold sores and that's herpes too, or a friend that discloses or a partner that says, Hey, by the way, when was your last STI screening? Um, and by the way, you know, I have herpes. So I just want you to know before we engage. So my personal experience and from chatting with others is that you don't really, you're not confronting it until you have to, right? We live in this place of ignorance and it's not necessarily our fault because as you said, it's, it's a systemic issue. We've got sex education that is often lacking. Uh, Even more comprehensive sex ed still could bolster itself up with regard to narratives around STIs. You've got legislation and policy uh, that aren't inclusive to all populations and specifically limit access to more marginalized populations. And our country has a history of uh, presuming, especially women specifically, are the carriers of STIs. So there's an added stigma there. Um, And then you just have your friends and your media groups that kind of reinforce each other from what you see on television. You know, how often do we see a show on television that doesn't put herpes as a joke, but rather invites people into a conversation that it's a real human thing that happens to a million people every day? You know, coming on to your account or getting onto Instagram and and stumbling across a STI educational platform like other you see resources starting to emerge? You see conversations starting to come out? So in the last five years that I've really been public and doing this work, I do believe there is more conversation. There are more people actively involved and willing to start that conversation and educate. Even people, you know, I have people emailing me saying, how do I start talking about STIs or STI stigma, specifically wanting to make their niche in that, which is really cool. So I do think we're in a better place. I don't know that it will be eliminated during our lifetime, but I'm hopeful that these conversations, as you very well said, uh, will become more human. I I think there's also a lot of misplaced fear around them where people think, like, for example, people see getting an HIV positive um, test as basically a death sentence. And it's like Mm -hmm. the scariest thing that you could ever get. But in reality, like medicine has gone a long way in terms of supporting people who are tested positive. If let's say, for example, you are tested positive for HIV, isn't, isn't it pretty much that you just take medicine as a treatment at this point? Like, what do do you know about that? It's a manageable it's a manageable infection. Yeah. You know, obviously that varies by each person's biology and with their doctor and what works for them, but largely like similar to herpes, it's manageable. Every STI is either curable, treatable, manageable. And so that would just be another level of like education and education not doing mm-hmm. its part in supporting. Because for me, when I was in, in high school, we did had a brief sex education class that was a few weeks long and they just showed us these images of STIs and they were like this will happen to you like be oh afraid like was do it the public it. or private institution public okay yeah in Massachusetts in Massachusetts um so it's like a little bit more open like there's a little bit we learned I think I had much better than some people but a lot of the discussion around STIs was totally fear-based and none of it was equipping us with the knowledge of what happens after you do get one. Um, Or how to communicate with partners 
or how to navigate a positive diagnosis because people I feel like are diagnosed and they think, you know, their love life and life is over and no one will accept them. But we, we haven't been given the tools to navigate such conversations or to know that there are routes available to us. Do you think that that lack of communication education directly contributes to STIs continuing to spread? You know, it's so funny you say that because I was thinking about that recently. And I, I do think that that's part of it. And I also think that mandated testing plays a role in that as well. And, you know, I've just made a post today on different types of herpes tests and screenings and things like that. Um, but the CDC doesn't include that in STI screening, you know, in your regular all-inclusive test. Uh, and there are several reasons for that. But there are arguments and people go back and forth. And even I go back and forth with myself in my head sometimes about, you know, should herpes be included? Because everyone does pretty much have one kind of herpes. Um, you know, the psychological impact is a lot with the stigma. But I also think it would really encourage conversation and help to normalize it as something like, oh, like, it's just herpes. Like, I'd, I'd love to get to that point where I'm surrounded by people or receive messages that say, you know, I'm in this place where I feel like it's just herpes, like it's okay. But yeah, I, I do think that plays a role. And what what kind of resources, I'm gonna go with in the classroom to start, it's where we, where we need to be starting. What kind of resources do you see needing to be there in order to make longer term change? So I think you need to have, I think we need to integrate more sex positive pleasure-based conversations all around sex ed. So I don't think we should necessarily, you know, I know it's hard as an educator breaking things down by days or topics or lessons, but I really think you need to make an effort as an educator to be inclusive throughout your, the time you have with your students. You know, how does, how does pleasure-based sex play with people with STIs? How does barrier methods, how does that impact that population? So really making a more inclusive effort um, to share, you know, and I think statistics are helpful because they do give that pathway like, wow, like I didn't know that. But how many of us really learned that the most common symptom of the most common symptoms of STIs is no symptom at all? You know, like like Amanda was saying, you know, you, you were taught to fear them and fear these most extreme cases likely of lesions or warts or whatever they were. But instead of, to t instead of teaching about how to approach or treat the symptom, I think we really need to approach how to engage in that communication with our partners, with ourselves, self-advocating with our practitioners. I think those are the conversations that we really need to instill in our students and in our friend groups too. Before we wrap up, I want to ask one more question, which is that a lot of people will assume if they're in a monogamous relationship and then their partner is diagnosed with herpes or an STI, that it means that they're not faithful or that they have cheated on them. Is that true? No. So I'll speak to herpes specifically here because it's so difficult with testing and it's hard to navigate. Uh, it's hard to know when you have it because most people don't have a testing history. Um, most people don't know they have it, you know, up to 90% of people have no idea that they have it because it's largely asymptomatic or they mistake it for razor burn or ingrown hairs. Um, you know, you're not tested for it. So how would you know? So, and you could have a partner who has cold sores, not know that that's herpes and that it could be transmitted genitally during oral sex. So there are a lot of possibilities within monogamous relationships that a herpes diagnosis can arise that doesn't automatically mean that someone was cheating on you or went astray. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in today. And we hope that this episode's given you something further to reflect upon. Uh, reach out to us with any of your questions or insights that you've gained from this on our Instagram page at Carnal Theory. And also, please check out Emily's work. You can head to emilydepass.com or you can find her on Instagram at Sex Education. That's Sex E L D U C A T I O N. Thank you, Emily. Thank you so much. Carnal Theory is produced by My Sex Bio. Our sound design is by Audrey Cohane, and our theme music by Men the Universe. My Sex Bio is an educational platform built to empower people like you to take command of your sexual biography. 
Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, TikTok, YouTube, and Spotify at MySexBio. Visit our website and join our e-letter at MySexBio.org and support our work by joining our Patreon. Thank you.